What happened to the Nazis after World War II? This question has intrigued historians for decades. As the dust of the cataclysmic conflict settled, a new world emerged, one that had to grapple with the chilling legacy of Adolf Hitler and his followers who had sown terror across Europe. Immediately after World War II, many Nazis were captured, especially those who did not have much power. However, many others managed to escape. The Allies would carry out various procedures to punish the detainees and find the fugitives. Let's see what happened to the Nazis and what plans were carried out to try to eradicate them from German society. The denazification and the atrocities carried out by the Nazis meant that the term denazification was used long before the end of the war. The Allies wanted to punish Germany once more, and after holding the Potsdam Conference in July 1945, they decided on three things, demilitarization, denazification, and the democratization of German and also Austrian territory. Starting in January 1946, the Allied Control Council began classifying individuals as major offenders, including activists, militarists, and beneficiaries, minor offenders, and those exonerated. Five years after the end of the conflict, some 450,000 Germans had been detained. post war II, Germany embarked on a rigorous process of denazification, scrutinizing citizens through Spruchkammer tribunals and exhaustive questionnaires aimed at unearthing Nazi affiliations. Given the vast number of Germans involved, this Herculean task was fraught with complexity and fear. As society faced the daunting challenge of disentangling itself from the pervasive influence of the Nazi legacy. In the area occupied by the British alone, 90 lawyers who had been Nazis were found. In the end, it was impossible to exclude them all from society. For example, there were doctors and teachers with Nazi affiliations who were necessary for the recovery of German society. The Allied powers began to leave the process of denazification to the Germans themselves, starting in 1946. The Nuremberg trials, after some disagreements, the Allies opted to carry out a justice plan for the Nazis detained immediately after the war, the Nuremberg trials. These trials would have judges from Great Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. The name comes from the city of Nuremberg, not only because the trials were held there, but also because it was the scene of Nazi rallies and parades. These trials would be conducted by an international military tribunal, and, in addition to applying due process of law to the Nazis, also aimed to educate the world about everything that had happened to prevent future genocides. The accused were subjected to psychological and psychiatric exams to try to find the root of so much evil. And although the results were documented, they disappeared from public view. One of the doctors who conducted these studies was the then famous military psychiatrist. But it was not until 2016 that these exams came to light again in Anatomy of Evil, The Enigma of the Nazi War Criminals, a book written by Dr. Joel Dimes. The Nuremberg trials began in November 1945 and concluded on October 1, 1946. In this first process, 22 Nazi leaders were brought to trial, and 12 of them were sentenced to hang. Ribbentrop, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alfred Rosenberg, a politician who collaborated with Hitler, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, SS General, Hermann Goering, politician and leader of the German militia, Wilhelm Keitel, commander of the High Command, Hans Frank, Nazi military and lawyer, Wilhelm Frick, Minister of the Interior until 1946, Arthur Seiss Inquart, Austrian politician and commissioner of the Netherlands, Julius Streicher, leader of the Franconia area, Fritz Saukel, notable Nazi politician, Alfred Jodl, notable officer, Martin Bormann, Hitler's private secretary, who was only processed in this trial. Some media claim that he had committed suicide on May 2, 1945, and others that he was a fugitive. The Dachau trials. These trials did not have the same media relevance as those conducted in Nuremberg. However, they allowed several war criminals who were prisoners in the territories occupied by the U.S. to be judged. The Dachau trials took place where the Dachau concentration camp operated. They were conducted between November 1945 and August 1948. One of the most notorious cases was known as the Malmedy Massacre process, in which the 74 accused, all members of the SS, were declared guilty and 43 of them were hanged. The rat lines, escape routes for many Nazis. Not all Nazis quickly faced justice. In fact, not all did, 
thanks to fleeing through the rat lines. The term was originally used because in nautical jargon, trap lines refer to ropes arranged horizontally, serving as steps on a kind of ladder for crew members to climb to the mast, which, in case the ship sank, was the last resource they used to save their lives. Thus, the rat lines became the last alternative that influential Nazis had to flee Europe, especially to the nations of America. The death of Hitler and the defeat of the Axis countries in World War II placed the Nazis, especially the leaders and architects of acts that filled humanity with horror, in a position of vulnerability. So the rat lines were the only and most viable alternative for them not to be reached by the justice of the Allies and the beginning of the Nuremberg trials. The Nazis feared reprisals for all the horror and the extermination machinery to which they subjected millions of people and fled by three routes. The northern route, which crossed Denmark with a destination to Sweden, where they finally took the ship. Another route was the Iberian, where the Nazis departed from Galicia with the help of the Nazis living in Spain. And the last route was the Italian, which was the most used. It is estimated that 90% of the Nazis escaped through it. What destinations did the Nazis who fled through the rat lines take? Some Nazis left for Canada, the US, the Middle East, Australia, and the United Kingdom. But the majority fled to South America. According to the BBC portal, based on documents of the Nazis that were revealed in 2012, about 9,000 of them arrived in this part of the American continent. More than half, about 5,000, settled in Argentina. It was even there where most of them disembarked, all thanks to the facilities granted by President Juan Perón, who was an enamored admirer of Hitler and the Nazi ideology. Before the Nazis fled Europe, hundreds of German immigrants already lived in Argentina. Many diplomats and intelligence officers were recruited by President Perón to facilitate the arrival of the fugitive Nazis to the South American nation. It is known that Nazi Otto Skorzeny became Eva Perón's bodyguard. Brazil was another destination. It is estimated that between 1,500 and 2,000 war criminals were sheltered. Meanwhile, between 500 and 1,000 Nazis arrived in Chile. In Bolivia was Klaus Barbie, a photographer and filmmaker who achieved success during the Nazi era and was the official photographer of Marshal Erwin Rommel, a man who almost reached the same popularity as Hitler. In Ecuador, Paraguay, and Colombia, it is also known that some Nazis were sheltered. South America, the destination of seven important Nazis. Adolf Eichmann in Argentina, a prominent SS man who devised the plan for the extermination camps to annihilate the Jews by banishing them from the European continent. He was the most sought after Nazi. He was in charge of identifying, gathering, and transporting the victims to the extermination camps, especially to those of Auschwitz, Treblinka. He was responsible for the death of at least six million people. The criminal escaped through the Italian route in 1950 and with a false identity fled to Argentina. His new name was Ricardo Clement. In Argentina, he lived with his family for a decade until the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, carried out a questionable operation to capture him as this operation violated Argentine sovereignty. Eichmann was captured on May 11, 1960 and transferred to Israel, where he was tried as a war criminal, found guilty after a four-month process, and sentenced to death. He was hanged on May 31, 1962. Joseph Mengele in Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. Joseph Mengele, also known as the Angel of Death, was one of the perpetrators of the many horrors carried out in the Auschwitz concentration camp. Mengele became, after Eichmann, the second major target of the Mossad. This Nazi was a doctor and conducted macabre experiments among the prisoners. He tortured and mercilessly killed. His atrocities reached pregnant women and children. After the war, he spent three years hidden in Germany and thanks to the help he received from members of the Catholic Church, arrived in Italy, where he departed for Argentina to settle there. On Argentine soil, he became the owner of a mechanical spare parts workshop. When Mengele learned of Eichmann's capture, he decided to move to Paraguay and their members of the Mossad were on his heels and it was then that he moved to Brazil. Many Nazi hunters were behind him Man's justice did not reach him as he drowned in 1979 off the Brazilian coast after suffering a stroke. 
but it was not until 1985 that his true identity was known when his body was exhumed. Walter Rauf in Argentina, Ecuador, and Chile, a colonel who became the third most important man in the SS. He was responsible for the death of about 200,000 Jews, whom he exterminated inside trucks with carbon monoxide. Rauf modified the position of the exhaust pipe so that the gases were expelled into the rear part of the truck, where the murdered victims were. In April 1945, Rauf was locked up by the Allies in the Ramini camp, from where he managed to escape in 1946 with the help of a priest and took refuge for two years in some Italian convents located in Rome and under the protection of Bishop Alois Hudal, who had an affinity with Nazi ideology. He was transferred to Damascus in 1948. In 1949, he fled to Argentina, but after the fall of President Perón in 1955, he went to Ecuador and three years later to Chile, where he ended up settling. Ralph was detained by the Chilean authorities in 1962. However, the Supreme Court denied the extradition request because, among other things, more than 15 years had passed, and for Chilean law, the crimes had prescribed. The fugitive Nazi was released. Later, he would end up working for the secret service of Augusto Pinochet and return to the torture of those who opposed the Chilean dictator, as published in 1974 by the French newspaper Le Monde. Pinochet denied the extradition requests made by West Germany. Ralph died in 1984 without being punished for his serious crimes. Franz Stangl in Brazil. This Austrian was known as White Death for the white uniform he wore, along with a whip. He participated in the Action T4 euthanasia program, in which people with physical and mental disabilities were killed. He also served as commander of the Sobibor extermination camp, and there alone ended the lives of about 100,000 Jews. He also commanded the Treblinka camp, where about 900,000 people were murdered while he was in charge. When the war ended, the Americans captured Stengel and locked him up in an Austrian prisoner camp, but he escaped in 1947, also with the help of Bishop Alois Hudal. Thanks to the Red Cross, he moved to Syria and, in 1951, would be leaving for Brazil. But in 1967, Simon Wiesenthal, one of the most renowned Nazi hunters, found his whereabouts, and he was arrested and then deported to West Germany. There he was tried and found guilty. He received a life sentence. However, in 1971, heart failure ended his life. Joseph Schwamberger in Argentina, this Austrian was an important SS commander. In 1942, he himself shot many people in the Rosvado forced labor camp, and the following year in the Przemysl camp, 500 Jewish prisoners were killed in a mass execution organized by Schwamberger. Schwamberger's notorious spree of violence was so extensive that Simon Wiesenthal described his trail as being strewn with corpses. Initially arrested in Austria in 1945, he managed a daring escape to Italy in 1948 before settling in Argentina under his real name. Despite West Germany's relentless pursuit, marked by a $300,000 bounty, it wasn't until 1987 that an informant's tip led to his arrest in Argentina and subsequent extradition to Germany. In 1992, justice was finally served with a life sentence. In 2004, already 92 years old, Schwamberger died. Gerhard Bona in Argentina, this lawyer served as an SS officer and was in charge of the logistics of the Acción T4 euthanasia program. In his eagerness to purify the race, he ended the lives of about 200,000 Germans with incurable diseases or physical or mental disabilities. Bona presented a report in which he openly accused his agency of corruption and fraud, and for that reason, he was expelled from the ranks of the Nazi party. Disguised and with a false identity, he fled to Argentina in 1949. But he returned to Germany after the overthrow of Juan Perón, and although he was captured and prosecuted in 1963 in the city of Frankfurt, he obtained bail. Then he decided to return to Argentina, but three years later he was captured and extradited again. Even so, he was not prosecuted because he was declared unfit to be judged. He lived until 1981. Few Nazis convicted, many Nazis managed to evade justice. Several lived with new identities, and others were reached already at very advanced ages. Some of them hid their past from their grandchildren, but over time, several cases would come to light. 
Mary Fulbrook, professor of German history at University College London, wrote the book Reckonings, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice, a linguistic material published in 2018 and in which she exposes that only about 6,656 Nazis were convicted in the trials that were held between 1946 and 2005. Even more insignificant if one considers that at least about 200,000 perpetrated the horrendous crimes of the Nazi era. Fulbrook revealed to CNN that in the end, most Nazis got away with it. The German justice and its fight against time. Many of the Nazis who escaped have probably already died or are very old. Until a few years ago, these perpetrators of crimes were still being captured, and imposing justice on them has become almost impossible. In 2018, Jacques Pollage, a Pole who in 1957 obtained American citizenship after hiding his Nazi past from the immigration service, was arrested in the U.S. at the advanced age of 95. By the time he became an American citizen, eight years had passed since he set foot on that nation's soil. Pollage was deported to Germany the same year of his capture and became the 68th Nazi to be captured in the U.S. But the trial process was suspended due to the lack of evidence, and if these do not appear, the case will not be reopened. In addition, the Central Office of the Administrations of Justice for the Investigation of National Socialist Crimes determined, based on German law, that it is no longer a punishable act to have been part of the SS ranks or to have received training in a Nazi camp. Moreover, charges could only be brought in the place where the suspect resides or in those where the concentration camps were located. In November 2018, the process also began for a former guard who worked at the Stutthof Nazi camp from June 1942 to September 1944. His name is Johann Raybogen, accused of being complicit in the murder of hundreds of people. The number of his victims is around 65,000, but the trial had to be suspended because Raybogen had heart and kidney problems. His delicate health condition ultimately influenced the trial to be canceled on April 3, 2019. Another known case is that of Bruno Day, a former SS guard who, between the ages of 17 and 18, worked at the Stutthof camp. In 2020, he was being prosecuted for having been complicit in the death of 5,232 people in the Stutthof camp where he worked. Day, 93 years old at the time of the trial and confined to a wheelchair, argued in his defense that he never voluntarily joined the SS. They serve as a stark reminder of the depths to which humanity can sink and the heights it can reach in its pursuit of justice. The impact of World War II and the fate of the Nazis continue to shape our world today. The legacy left by this gruesome period in history is profound, casting long shadows over modern Europe and beyond. The advanced age of those who could still be tried makes it difficult to carry out due process. Most Nazis lived in hiding and without serving sentences, all thanks to the complicity of third parties who had affinities with their ideology. The world, possibly, will only have the satisfaction that some Nazis received their punishment, although there were innocent Germans who also ended up paying for others' crimes. This concept has since been ingrained into international law and continues to guide our approach to justice in the face of war crimes and genocides. But perhaps the most significant legacy of World War II and the Nazis is the lessons we've learned from this dark chapter in history. It has taught us about the dangers of hate, intolerance, and unchecked power. It has shown us the devastating consequences of turning a blind eye to injustice and it has underscored the importance of standing up against oppression, no matter where it occurs. These lessons continue to guide us, reminding us of the importance of vigilance, empathy, and a commitment to justice. We hope this video has been useful to you. If you have something to add, please share it with us in the comments section. Like this video and send the link to your family and best friends so they also know more about what happened to the Nazis after World War II. If you are new to our channel, do not forget to subscribe. Don't forget to follow us on all our social networks, which will be down here in the description.